Nosso próximo painel vai falar sobre um tema cada vez mais relevante na carteira dos nossos clientes. Agora a gente vai falar sobre crédito privado. I would like to welcome to stage Michael Smith, sócio e co-head da Ares Global Credit Group, e para a moderação, Graziella Awada, sócia do BTG Pactual. Hi all, first of all, thank you so much for being here to, with us today. And uh, so Michael, if you could please start talking a little bit about yourself and uh, a brief description, a, big, a brief introduction and about Iris as well. Great, uh, thank you all for being here and thank you for hosting us uh, this morning. Uh, my name is Michael Smith, I'm a partner at Aries Management. Um, Aries is a global alternative asset manager operating throughout the broad alternative asset market. Um, we have funds doing private equity. We have funds in the secondaries markets. We run uh, real asset funds across uh, real estate and infrastructure, uh, but we're very much known um, as a credit manager. Uh, today we have about 425 billion under AUM. Uh, and just over 300 billion of that is, are in credit assets. Um, I joined the firm in 2004 to start our private credit market. We'll have a nice chat on private credit. Uh, it's something I've dedicated my entire life pretty much to investing in. Um, prior to joining Aries in 2004, um, I was an investment banker at Solomon Brothers um, in the FIG group. I know there's some FIG bankers here, and so uh, my heart goes out to you. I did that for four or five years, but it really gave me some insight um, into capital formation for financial institutions, how they operate, how they manage liabilities, um, and a lot of that has led to the success of Aries, just understanding financial institutions and how they work as both competitors and obviously now today um, operating Aries. Okay, so let's just start here. How do, how do you see nowadays the private market uh, credit? Sure. So the, the private credit market has had a long evolution, um, probably one that's a little bit misunderstood. Um, I think if I think back 20 years um, as we started making loans to private companies and even before that um, with, within bank environments, um, there was, there was a, a, a notion that as a non-bank lender, um, we were being sub-selected into assets that were more risky. Um, that if a bank didn't do it, they would come to a non-bank lender like Aries. Um, and that very much was not the truth and very not um, what we experienced when we started Aries and began making loans. Um, we predominantly focused on middle market companies um, and we did that in partnership with private equity firms. Um, and what we found um, going back to 2003, 2004 was that the private equity owners and the, the companies that they bought were looking for more partnership oriented, more flexible capital. Many of them had desires to grow their businesses both or, organically, um, where they um, felt the need and the want to take the cash flow of the business and instead of paying back their loans, reinvest it into the businesses and or needed capital um, post the acquisition in order to grow the business through acquisition. Um, that gave us an opportunity to differentiate ourselves from the banks, to um, help them develop a flexible capital structure that, meet, that, that met their organic needs um, to grow the business. Um, and what's happened is over the past 20 years, um, that flexible capital structure has led to our ability to finance more companies but also allowed us to become much more of a relationship-oriented lender with both the companies and the private equity firms. The true catalyst to the business um, ha are really twofold. Um, there has been a trend of bank consolidation that's been going on in the US and really throughout the world um, for the past 30 years. Um, and as banks continue to drive efficiencies by consolidating deposits and focusing on larger companies. Um, 
that has been coupled with reg a, a very strict regulatory regime. As banks got bigger, the government got more leery of their performance and the activities, um, which led them to further regulate. That, that was emphasized and really crystallized um, during the financial crisis. Um, so as banks teetered um, and their balance sheets got upside down, more regulation went into the banks. And that was really kind of the seminal catalyst for direct lending to grow. Um, it also coincided with the second big theme. So if bank consolidation and bank regulation was one, uh, the second one was really the growth and maturation of the private equity business. Um, and that really started to catalyze post-financial crisis. Um, when we started the business in 2004, household private equity firms like Carlyle, um, like Blackstone, even some of the, the newer tech firms like Toma Bravo, and um, they had $500 million, $700 million funds. Um, and as they started to raise larger funds and invest more capital into private companies, um, our investment opportunity began to grow. Um, so it's really been a 20-year history of really, I think, providing a great service that the banks weren't able to provide. Um, the banks continuing to abandon the middle market and, and slightly larger companies. As the private equity firm's capital base grew, we matched that growth with growth in our credit business. And so very much the history of Aries, not just in credit, but in real estate um, and in infrastructure and other assets um, have mirrored banks inability to finance those companies because of regulatory or because of a focus on larger companies where they can underwrite and distribute um, have created a, 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 the, the opportunity for us over the past 20 years that we've taken advantage of. Can you please provide us a history of asset class and what secular trends you are seeing today? Yeah, so I, I, I believe that the, the asset class will continue to grow. Um, and if I look at just the, the private credit markets globally, um, I, I believe that there will be continued bank consolidation. Uh, we saw a, a, a small wave of consolidation with regard to the failure of Silicon Valley Bank um, and the subsequent merger of First Republic with JP Morgan. Um, and I just feel that the regulatory restraints on those companies, um, they will be forced to be better capitalized um, they will be forced to be, as we always say, um, more boring um, uh, and start to look more like insurance companies that kind of really hold deposits um, and, and, and interact with the consumer, um, but really aren't investment uh, partners. Um, our market continues to grow. Private equity continues to grow. Um, we see, um, we are now seeing kind of the inverse effect of what was kind of the myth 20 years ago, um, where 20 years ago people thought that we were getting self-selected into the worst companies and taking risk. I think today private lenders and private investors kind of sub-select into the best companies. We understand what we are looking for. We know the types of businesses that we want to invest in. Um, we go find those, we partner with private equity, we help them grow. And banks have defaulted into more of a broker um, or a distributor where they take companies that might not be able to get credit from a private lender and help them find other sources of capital. Um, so we're very bullish on, on, on just the whole macro environment as it relates to alternative investments. Um, there is something um, very unique um, to the companies about having privately held investors, um, whether that's in the, the equity of stack of the capital structure or in, the lend, or in the lender group. It just allows them to be more flexible um, in how they operate their businesses. It allows them to, to take um, you know, the idea of hyper-organic growth or acquisition growth more seriously. Um, and you see that in the broader markets. The, the number of publicly traded uh, companies on the New York Stock Exchange has gone from 8,000 to less than 5,000. Um, and what that means is that companies are staying private longer because the capital is there for them to achieve their growth um, without the scrutiny of being a publicly traded company. Um, and for an investor's perspective, 
if you are just investing in the U.S. private equity, uh, in the U.S. Uh, broadly uh, indexed markets, the publicly traded markets, you are trading within 4,000 companies and there are upwards of 250,000 companies that need capital. Um, and so we always say you're, you're, you're really investing in 3% in of the addressable market and that you should get you know, involved into alternatives and privates because that is where a lot of capital is being driven to great companies. Okay, and what is the current market opportunity and how are you positioning yourselves? So, um, Aries has really built itself um, on a number of different factors. I would say the two things that are most important to us um, are size and scale of our team and size and scale of our platform. And so for Aries, we want to be large scale players in large markets. Um, and private credit is the perfect example of that. We scaled our assets from that 2004 period where we had about a billion dollars of assets under management um, to about $220 billion globally, US, Europe, and Asia focused on direct lending. Um, we again cater to private equity sponsors. Um, we think that that addressable market makes us about a one or two percent market player. So these are huge, large addressable markets. Um, the U.S. loan market on the broadly syndicated is close to three trillion dollars. The high yield market is close to two trillion dollars. You add a direct lending market, which is you know probably you know, quoted somewhere around 1.7 trillion is probably bigger if you add other asset classes, um, such as ABL lending and things like that that are directly originated. Um, so while we're a big player, the, the addressable market is huge. Um, and so we continue to believe that we will find great investment opportunities in those markets. Um, and Aries as a, as a firm is very much situated like that. Even with 425 billion of AUM, if you aggregate the addressable markets across real estate, infrastructure, private equity, and private credit, we believe we're a less than 1% market um, player. Lots of room for different competitors, lots of room for um, you know, large scale players besides Aries, um, each with niches and, and investment opportunities they like. But what we think is our competitive advantage is we've picked certain markets like sponsor finance in, in the private credit market. Um, we've built size and scale. Um, it brings a lot of synergies across the investment. Um, and we think that that's really kind of how we're positioning for the firm for growth. You were saying that that there is a lot of room to grow, to growth, and what is the bank's part on on this on this scenario? Yeah, the banks, the bank behavior and um, kind of banks' role in the ecosystem has changed dramatically. Um, I think one of the premises, which I think will probably resonate with a lot of the people in the room, is um, there are a lot of in, investors in in our world, in the private equity world that don't trust banks. <laughs> um, they are there um, sporadically. Um, federal policies, um, you know, and different macroeconomics and even just leadership dictate the behavior of the bank where private equity comp uh, firms and companies that they buy or even, you know, standalone um, owner operated family owned businesses want a consistent trusted partner who um, builds a relationship and will have capital available for them in good times and in bad, not just in good times. Um, so the banks have evolved um, pretty dramatically over the past 20 years. Um, I would say very much they were competitors 20 years ago. Um, over the first 10 years of developing our private credit business, um, because of bank consolidation and because of bank regulation, we saw them move up market and focus more on the distribution of credit. Um, they have, the banks have helped fuel what we would call the broadly syndicated market. Um, they help with CLO formation, but today about 85% of even the broadly syndicated market assets are distributed to outside investors or investors that are outside of the bank. Um, over the last 10 years, we've actually seen them become strong partners of private credit. And I know that 
that might be counter to some, what some people think. Um, but the, the banks are now really wholesale lenders to private, lend, to private um, credit firms. And so if we have a public company or a private credit fund where we are making investments, they are providing typically around one turn of leverage to those vehicles. Um, it's an efficient way for them to get access to those assets um, in a delevered manner. So that is actually a, you know, could be a, it could be a triple A to single A type of um, rated security. Um, and that's how they view that. Um, so they've actually, over the past 10 years, very much become partners with us. Um, they don't have the teams. So again, going back to size and scale, they don't have the capital or the, the human capital to find those assets, underwrite those assets, and invest in those companies. And so they're getting access to that by partnering with private credit. Um, I think as we evolve in the next 10 years, um, I think they will continue to move out of the markets um, and continue to be our par partners on the financing side. Um, and then big stewards of kind of driving business to us um, because they just don't, don't have the wherewithal to hold those assets on their balance sheet. And uh, how is your portfolio performing nowadays? And uh, the ex I mean, the existing portfolio and uh, with all this, uh, the, the macroeconomy scenario? Yep. Yeah, so obviously a big topic for discussion is kind of retrospective. So as we look in the rear view mirror, um, there's been quite a turbulent macroeconomic environment um, and also quite a turbulent geopolitical environment um, across the world that has affected our portfolios. Um, and we, get, we are taking a lot of questions on how higher interest rates have affected the portfolio, um, how inflation and now trying to curb inflation has affected our portfolios. Um, for the most part, um, I think we're starting to hear a more positive tone um, about the U.S. economy, about the European economy and, and, and economies in which we are, you know, making most of our investments. Um, and that is re pretty reflective in what we're seeing in the portfolio. Um, there was a period of time in the 2001-2002 timeframe where as interest rates were increasing, um, many companies got tight on cash flows. Um, transactions that were underwritten for companies that thought their interest rate was going to be 8% um, and over um, one of the most, if not the most rapid increase um, in interest rates with base rates going from zero to five, um, they found themselves in a, a situation fairly quickly um, where the interest rates had gone from seven or eight to 11 or 12. Um, I think one of the nice things about our asset class and it being private, um, is that we privately negotiate transactions with these borrowers um, and now we can privately amend them. Um, in, in the reality, we didn't do many amendments. Um, we had lots of conversations. Um, I think interest rates got to a point where we try to underwrite companies to um, have enough cash flow post their, um, their EBITDA um, to some have somewhere between two and a two and a half times coverage on their interest. Um, we did see that number come down precipitously. Um, many companies got to 1.3, 1.4, but not to a breaking point. I think the Fed did a nice job um, raising rates in order to curb inflation, but not put companies in such peril um, that they were, there was panic on the street. Um, we have a very high quality portfolio. Most of our companies in our portfolio are growing um, even in a more, you know, uh, recessionary environment. I wouldn't say we're in a recession, but definitely a more muted consumer um, and less growth environment. Most of our companies are growing in the low single digit, uh, sorry, the high single digit, low double digit range. And over the past two years, we've seen them really grow into their capital structures. Um, so it was actually a nice period where excess cash flow that the companies were generated instead of going to the balance sheet and accruing to the equity, we're accruing to the lenders with higher interest rates, but not such, a, not such that we um, felt like we were at risk on not getting paid back. I think it's, it, it was really demonstrated 
um, the high quality underwriting that we do and other private lenders do, um, the focus on downside protection. We look at those metrics, we're looking at the interest coverage ratios. As we model companies and look at investments, we think about interest rate volatility. Uh, we think about lower growth environments. We think about lower margins, um, just given competitive dynamics and in industries. And all of that goes into um, our decision on how much leverage to give those companies um, and suits us very well when there is volatility in those companies. It did lead us to believe that the Fed would keep rates higher for longer. I know that that has been something that has... Um, you know, I think miffed economists that there weren't interest rate cuts during 2024. I think my personal view and our firm view, having so much data and having invested in so many companies where we saw them push to the brink but not through their comfort zone, that the Fed would keep them at the brink for longer. Um, and I think that's really played out over the first half of 2024. And with an election now in the US, um, I think monetary po policy will be quite muted. And I don't think that there'll be a rate cut this year. And if there is one, it'll be probably post-election. Um, and then the Fed will start to revisit where they are there. So historically, we feel really good about the portfolio. Um, it should give investors, um, new and old to the asset class, um, you know, a lot of comfort about um, the quality of the businesses that we're underwriting, um, the quality of the work we're doing, um, and, and the underwriting standards that we and other direct lenders put on the, the companies. And how is the underlining fundamentals? You told us about all your, in your portfolio and the private credit space in general, if you could detail a little bit more. Yeah, so on a go-forward basis, as we think about new transactions, um, Really since the beginning of 2023, we've now been in this post-inflation, um, post-interest rate hike environment. Um, we are seeing um, companies' ability to take on debt as being, you know, muted. <laughs> um, so our underwriting standards are still back up to that, you know, two times, two and a half times interest coverage ratio, which means um, indicative over the past 18 months have been companies that have been able to take less debt. So you have less leverage on businesses. Um, you've seen further bank retrenchment and bank consolidation. Um, I think we at Aries do a very good job matching our liabilities with our assets on a corporate level. Banks don't do that so well. Um, and so they've continued to retrench from the market in a higher interest rate environment. Um, with a lot of fixed liabilities on their, on their balance sheets. Um, so um, we've, we've actually seen a wonderful market where I think we've taken more share of the market, um, given that we were open and, and given all of the, the dynamics that I was talking about earlier. Um, and it's been a wonderful investment period uh, where the, we are underwriting with less leverage, um, with tighter documents um, and just a really high qu credit quality of portfolios on a go-forward basis. Okay, and we're, we're talking here uh, uh, before we start here and uh, I was asking you about Brazil. So do you think Brazil is out of favor uh, nowadays uh, for the, the investors? Yeah, so we get a lot of inquiries from investors about what's next, what's the next market, um, we've exhibited the ability to take our franchise that we built in the U.S. Um, we built a very large and strong business in Europe, very similar markets uh, and actually quite similar um, clients in that many of our private equity clients are operating in U.S. and Europe. Um, we are in the process of growing a much larger presence in APAC. Um, with offices in Hong Kong, we're about to open in, Ch in China and uh, Japan um, and Australia kind of being our strongholds. Um, but we're constantly asked about Brazil, India, really large addressable markets with, with good economies, with uh, good companies that are seeking capital. Um, we are scoping those markets. Um, our investors are asking about that. Um, I think like other areas like in Europe, it took us about five years to scope that out and, and, fi and finally do that. Um, Asia, we did through an acquisition, so we built a presence there. Um, I think eventually 
um, private credit solutions will be wonderful for places like Brazil and India and other you know, large addressable growing markets. Um, but I think you, we need to be patient and do that. One thing we do do at Aries is separately capitalize all of those businesses. So we would never make one master fund that says we're direct, we're, we're investing in private credit and try to do US, Europe, China, and Brazil in that. Um, so I think one thing that we've said is we could separately capitalize those business. So if Brazil becomes what we think is an attractive investable opportunity, you would see us separately capitalize it. You would see us grow a team of people that is local, uh, that understands the markets, that understands um, you know, the interactions with the government and with the banks. Um, and then we would have, then investors would be able to say, I am already invested in your US direct lending fund or your European and I will, would like to invest in this. So the investment decision would be separate, but then you would be able to benefit from all of the coordination and information that we do as a large global firm that would make us be better investors in China, in India, in Brazil, or any other market that we go into. And I do think that that's really important. I think that, you know, one, one thing that we've seen at Aries is as we've grown our global presence um, is just the information that we can get. Just thinking, just if you just take geopolitical risk, um, being such an active investor in the US, Europe, and Asia, and having strong ties, cross-pollination on investment committees, um, and just a lot of information sharing makes us all better investors, and we would bring that to an emerging market also. Uh, are there certain macroeconomic, regulatory, or other type of risks in the industry, and how are you working through them? Yeah, so I, I would take, I'll take that in two parts. One, on the investment side, um, kind of how we think about regulatory risk and or macroeconomic risk, um, and then globally, you know, as Aries, as a broad scale kind of diversified alternative asset manager. On the investment side, it's paramount. Um, we are credit people first, um, and we do primary private equity style. I hate saying that because it makes us sound like we weren't, uh, but we do we do exhaustive diligence on every investment that we make um, in our private credit, in our infrastructure, and in our real estate debt businesses. Um, we tend to diligence businesses for somewhere between three and nine months before we make an investment. So we are from day one working alongside a private equity firm or a real estate investment firm or an entrepreneur that's buying a business um, and get a very you know, in-depth look at the business, which includes, if it's a healthcare business or an education business, a deep dive into the regulatory environment in that industry and how it affects that company. Um, so very important to look at that um, and then you go and look at, you know, the geopolitical risks, where are they sourcing from, where are they distributing product, what could disrupt that business. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, we are incorporating all of that into financial models and looking at different scenarios. If this happened, what would be the cause and effect to this company? So it's, it's paramount in our investment process. Um, it is core to what everybody thinks about. Um, as they are looking at companies. Um, and again, the, it, I would say that this is probably the one area where experience matters. And so as you're thinking about investing in private credit, private equity alternatives, um, incorporating these macro uh, you know, scenarios into the investment philosophy and protecting your downside, even if you're thinking about private equity, um, is where a seasoned manager, an experienced manager, someone who's been in the markets for 10, 20, 30 years um, is of paramount. Um, as I think about then, you know, regulatory risks um, uh, and geopolitical risks as Aries, um, we, we spend a lot of time consolidating our thoughts about making sure that our assets and liabilities match from a tenure and from a fixed versus floating rate. Um, so, um, we're not immune to Fed action. We're not immune to interest rates going up and down. Um, we try our best to match funds. Most of what we do on the loan side is floating rate. 
and most of our liabilities, not surprisingly, are floating rate. Um, we, are, we do not try to time markets. We do not try to be cute around that. Um, and that's kind of paramount to what we do as a firm. Um, and again, having this broad global lens across different asset classes helps us manage those exposures. We, we help our investors hedge their investments uh, from a currency perspective. Um, we offer, you know, different entry points into funds and different hedging strategies, um, both from a, you know, an FX and a tax perspective. Um, so again, all of these risks, um, then we can bubble up to a corporate perspective um, and, and help do that. And so my, my comment there would be um, similar to experience on the investing side dealing with that. I do believe size and scale when you're investing into an asset manager are incredibly important and are getting more important um, as the world evolves and as more investors around the globe comes into our funds. I think partnering with one of the premier you know, alternative asset managers just gives you a, a much broader lens into these risks and a much bigger toolkit to address those. Um, and so it was probably the, the one of the biggest reasons why we went public as Aries Management um, eight years ago, ten, I think it's actually 10 years ago, um, was to, to grow in size and scale and, and become one of those managers. Um, and again, it makes us much more um, knowledgeable about, you know, knowing your customer and dealing with regulatory inquiries. Um, I've seen many small competitors go under an SEC investigation for a public fund and just not have the resources or the tools to answer the questions. Um, and they get bogged down on it and end up in SEC reviews for two, three years. Um, large scale investors like Aries know the people, know the drill, know how to answer those questions, um, set our facts out, um, and hopefully will keep us away from you know, the type of regulations that banks are under. And what are your perspectives for the next 10 years in this market, in the, in the credit private, private market? Yeah, again, I, I, I believe all of these trends are going to continue. Um, I, I, I talk to my colleagues and that run other parts of the firm. I talk to um, the business leaders across the, the credit businesses. Um, all of us believe that we can grow our business um, at 15 to 20 percent per annum um, without subjecting us to greater risk or, or taking on more risk in order to get those, those, um, the, that, that capital invested. Um, again, I, I wholeheartedly believe, and I know it might sound semi self-serving, um, but there definitely is a consolidation going in on in the alternative space um, where I do think larger is better. Um, we're seeing LPs consolidate. Um, we're, we have many um, LPs that we've converted into what we would call global relationships, um, where they are coming to us and saying, we would rather invest in six of your funds across an aggregate couple of billion dollars um, than have 12 different managers managing 12 strategies across $2 billion. Um, it makes their lives easier, it's much more efficient. They can hold us to a, a higher standard um, and they get a consistency of product around that. So I'm very bullish on, the, on, on, on our ability to grow. I'm very bullish on, on the fact that size and scale matters. Um, and I think you're starting to see, I read a statistic uh, last week that even in something, an asset class like private credit, um, where there's a lot of talk about new entrants and a lot of capital being raised, um, that 60% of all of the capital raised over the past three years went to the top 20 or 25 managers. Um, so I think investors are starting to see the benefits of that size and scale. Um, there's also, um, I think, which is exciting for this market, um, a trend uh, towards the retailization of our product offering. Uh, 10 years ago, um, there, there was very limited access to private equity, private credit to your, you know, high net worth or ultra net high net worth investor. Um, and I think those, those gates and those barriers are being broken down through product development, through evergreen funds, um, through awareness uh, and just distribution through partners like your firm and others 
um, that have been working with alternative asset managers to customize programs, um, to manage some of the liquidity needs and desires. Um, and and I, it's amazing, but in the US, if you looked at the four large wirehouses and you looked at their private banks being a $3 trillion market opportunity, um, we've only scratched the surface of, of the, that capital. Um, and I think that um, you'll, see, you'll see a rapid increase um, in the adoption of alternatives into that channel. Again, fueling kind of what I believe will be um, a nice run for, for alternatives over the next 10 years. And how you differentiate yourselves in an increasingly crowded space? Yeah, I, I, I get that one a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and I very much appreciate that um, when you uh, put, pa put things down in black and white on a piece of paper, uh, you could probably compare five or six pitch books um, and they might look quite similar. Uh, my first line of defense is that we've been doing it for 30 years and everybody's stealing our ideas, but that doesn't go too far. Um, and so for me, and it, it, it also ties into, you know, what keeps you up at night? I get that question a lot, you know, what are you, what are you doing? Um, for me, uh, I'm, I'm less now in the deal business. Um, I spent a better part of 20 years on the road visiting companies, doing diligence. Um, I think it made me a, a good investor, seeing so many deals, committing, doing all that. Um, I think it's also made me a better, you know, fundraiser. Um, and I think it's made the firm better. Our firm is, is led by individuals that grew up in the deal business. Um, and our investment committees are cross-pollinated with people from different, different, you know, areas of the firm. So as a credit professional, I sit on our infrastructure and real estate debt businesses, investment committees, and I hear what's going on there. Um, so this idea of, I think, information sharing wherever we can. There are instances where we set up walls and we're not allowed to, um, but for me, just the idea of all of the information that we can gather on a company, on an industry, on the markets, where are things pricing, where are funds flowing, um, makes us a better investor. And as we get bigger, I think the, one of the biggest challenges and desires for us at Aries is to keep that partnership orientation. I know that, that resonates in this room with the BTG crowd um, keep the you know keep that collegiality that that culture that partnership sharing information you know uh, referring each other deals so a hyper focus on on collaboration directly originating all of our deals so hiring more people so I always walk out of conferences or investor meetings and I say I one promise I will make to you is that as we grow, we will continue to hire more talented people to make sure that we are very selective, that information is flowing, that we're doing all of our work. Um, and for me, and I think most of us on the executive management team, it's really about keeping that, that blocking and tackling and culture where we are well informed and then everybody is rowing in the same direction so that we find those opportunities, we directly originate them, we go visit the companies, we do our diligence, um, we share and collaborate as it relates to the macroeconomic environment and the regulatory environment um, and, and do that. Direct lending is probably the poster child for that. Um, I think that we have really built a moat in our global direct lending business um, and we look at the stats just as if we were analyzing a company, we analyze ourselves. Um, and we're very focused on the KPIs of our business. Um, an originator who covers a private equity firm should cover somewhere between seven and 10 firms, not 20. It's, in, it, it's just that they get spread too thin. Uh, they don't build meaningful relationships. Um, they go and do a deal with one company and neglect 19 other clients. Um, so it's very linear um, and you always have to develop talent and promote talent. Um, and frankly, some of our best originators that cover some of our best firms, uh, one of our originators in Boston who covers Advent, Bain and TA, that's a full job. That's a full-time job. 
um, and, and she has two other resources below her um, that help her cover that, those three firms. Um, and that's what makes our relationship with those firms differentiated because we're in their office, we're doing deals with them, we're looking at every deal with them. We have the capital base to basically do every deal. And so that type of attention to detail, attention to building relationships and doing that, uh, it seems so easy um, and it seems so um, intuitive 20 years ago. There were probably only 100 buyout firms that were meaningful. Um, but when we started Aries, we're like, well, if there's 100 firms, we need 20 people, uh, 30 people, 40 people to go cover them. Um, and so we, we did that. I think we were the first, first to kind of really invest in that team. Um, and we felt that that was what led to better credit selection because the team was able to generate a thousand deals to do a hundred deals. Uh, and so we always say that if you have, if you have one person covering 30 sponsors, uh, you're going to get kind of self-selected into, you know, maybe not the best deals. And so, um, from my perspective, I think what, what there's, there's something special at Aries just about how we've org organically grown the business. Um, and that attention to, to the culture, the investment philosophy, the people, um, that all become the inputs into, into the investment. Okay, and how do you see areas uh, in the future? I mean, what is the, the next steps? Yeah, so again, I think that for, from my perspective, it's blocking and tackling in our existing businesses. We, we wholeheartedly believe in, in the, that, um, you know, away from private credit where we're clearly a market leader. Um, I think that our real estate debt platform and our real our infrastructure debt platform which I'm much closer to just being a debt guy. So I'm not disparaging the equity sides of those businesses, but I do have my hand in those other businesses. Um, I'm, I'm incredibly excited about those market opportunities. Um, digital infrastructure in, is a, you know, probably a $3 trillion annual investment opportunity um, for all of us globally. Um, and again, if I think about our, uh, infrastructure debt business, getting, getting 1% of that market opportunity. There are businesses like that that we can, that we can take advantage of. Um, all of the, the um, assets in credit as it relates to asset-backed financing, which has a very broad moniker, um, but that could be anywhere from buying consumer loans to real estate um, to, you know, pools of solar panels that generate savings to, um, you know, their, the clients that put them on their house. Uh, there are lots of assets, leasing, et cetera, um, that banks are starting to shy away from, tim similar to what they have done on the corporate side. Um, and so we call that alternative credit, um, either lending to pools of assets that generate interest um, um, or cash flows or buying pools of assets um, to, to realize the, the um, residual values of those assets um, are, are enormous market opportunities that we are very big players in but could become bigger players in. And I think in, in my tenure <laughs> over the next you know, 10 plus years, um, I'll take a little shorter uh, uh, you know, time frame. Um, I think it's to scope new markets but continue to try to be a market leader and develop continued market leaders in some of the ones where we're scaled but, but not scaled to the point where I think we could be. Um, and again, I think we could, we could scale further and direct lend it, but, but really excited about that market opportunity and uh, pot potentially the next leader will be the one that really scopes and, and nails Brazil. Um, but um, we, will, we will definitely put the tools in place to be able to evaluate that. Um, and if that opportunity presents itself earlier, um, we obviously want to, want to try to be in front of that. Okay, unfortunately, we are a little bit out, out of time. So thank you very much for your, your presence here. Thank you.